Our second speaker will be Ian Oliver. He is a distinguished member of technical staff at Nokia Bell Labs, specializing in trusted computing and safety critical systems. He can be found shooting arrows from horses, too. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's actually a warning. OK. So give a warm applause to Ian. OK, fortunately, my colleague who presented earlier has answered all the questions. So this should be good uh, and easy. OK, so trusting your pie. Uh, this is a really high level, incomplete introduction to using a TPM with a Raspberry Pi. And by definition, IoT, because anything with an ARM processor is IoT these days. So if you want to go and impress your bosses and say you learned all about trust computing and IoT, there you are. OK, uh, about me, yes, I do dangerous hobbies with dangerous animals, and I like shooting people, I mean targets. Um, I wrote a best-selling book. My claim to fame is that I outsold Bruce Schneier for two weeks on Amazon in paperback. I sold four books. He sold three. Uh, <laughs> Um, and if you speak to any of my colleagues, they'll say I've got a really unhealthy obsession with aircraft and strange diseases. Um, yeah, so by the way, that was the first ever picture of an A380 flying into Finland. Uh, not 380, 350. So that's my other claim to fame. Uh, that's Ebola. Uh, our lunchtime conversations are bizarre, trust me. Okay, so the trusted platform module, which you learned about in the previous uh, lecture, a little bit more details about that. Um, it's the little black square you can see on there. That's an Infineon SLB9670 evaluation board for Raspberry Pi. Um, nice little board. It's got some really nice features, which I'll tell you about uh, later. A um, few things about the TPM, though. Uh, first of all, it's not a CPU. It does not run any code. You cannot run code on this thing. That's really important. It's not a crypto accelerator. Yes, it has crypto functions, but do not try passing anything more than about 256 bytes through this thing. Um, if you try to encrypt a four gigabyte virtual machine, you're gonna be there for weeks. It's not a crypto accelerator, and that's by design. It's not spying on you. Go to, well, the Linux forums, Windows forums, anywhere on the internet, TPM, really bad spying on you. It's not, it just sits, it's a little passive device. Uh, there's no need to wear a tinfoil hat around these things. I mean, look at us. It hasn't affected us too much. Um, it doesn't read your mind. Uh, it does not prevent you from running Linux. This is something I learned on Linux forums. If you go back to about 2008, uh, somebody wrote, my PC or my laptop has a TPM. I can't run Linux on this. Well, you know, I think there are other reasons. The TPM does not prevent you doing that. You can still run Linux. Don't worry about it. Um, it's not necessarily a piece of hardware. It could be a set of services, firmware, TPM, and so on. Um, I just realized some of the things have run the wrong way. Uh, it does not have a direct connection to the NSA. This is something else I also learned off Linux forums. Somebody was worried about the TPM sending all their data to uh, the American government. It does not do that, really. Um, trust me, Windows does. But uh, And it wasn't invented by Bill Gates. That's the other thing I learned about these things over the years. OK. Um, Yes, it's a piece of, it has secure storage. Uh, it has some key generation functions, which are really useful. It's a root of trust for reporting. Um, I'll explain a little bit what that means later on. Um, it has some other crypto functions on there, hashing. It has symmetric key functions. It's got a whole bunch of interesting algorithms that can be placed on these things. Typically, RSA, DES, AS, and all these things are there. Um, if you buy a TPM from the US, it has some extra symmetric encryption functions which aren't allowed to be shipped outside the US, and if you buy them from China, they will have some Chinese encryption functions on there. Um, these may or may not have backdoors, so your mileage may vary. RSA is pretty okay, though. Um, and it also has a notion of device identity, which is really, really useful. And the really nice thing about this, on some of the TPMs, you can even change the identity, which is permanent. Okay, that's a TPM. Uh, this you might recognize as being a Raspberry Pi with a TPM evaluation board on it. Um, minor problem with the TPM evaluation boards is they stick up in the air, so you know, none of your cases fit anymore. But that's an excuse to go get a 3D printer. Um, yeah, I apologize for the naming of the devices. Yes, everything is named after diseases, but hey. Okay, 
A few things about what we have on here. Uh, first of all, this is a TPM2 evaluation module. It's an Infineon SLB 9670, 9670 being one of the TPMs that Infineon produce. Um, I don't work for Infineon, it's just they're the only people who produce evaluation boards for Raspberry Pis, so you're kind of stuck. Sorry. Uh, it sits on the GPIO pins. Uh, this has some other implications a bit later on. Um, ostensibly, the SPI bus. It has a really useful reset button. This will be your friend when you're playing with this thing. I'll explain later with a really funny story. A very sad and expensive story, but a funny one all the same. Um, and it also sits, well, because it's sitting on the GPIO pins, it has a direct connection to the power supply. The Raspberry Pis have a really weird way of dealing with power on board. So, uh, and this will come back to haunt you a little bit, uh, especially if you're in a different country to the actual device you're working on which is why last night I couldn't reboot the damn thing. Okay. Unfortunately, the Raspberry Pi is not designed to be trusted. It is not a secure device. It does not matter how much security you put on this thing. If you're running Raspbian, you compile SE Linux into the kernel, you run Linux IMA, um, you know, you turn off Telnet. Um, by the way, has anybody ever changed the default password and username on their Raspberry Pis? Mm, liars. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, every Pi on the planet you can log into with Pi Raspberry. You can't change it. And, it, and you can do this over SSH, so it's secure. Um, anyway, so all that, forget all that, because you know, the hardware itself cannot be trusted. Uh, there's no core root of trust measurement on this thing. So if you're in the previous lecture, you understood that. We need somewhere where we actually know where everything starts off, we can measure it. It's got some of the properties of this. There is a piece of ROM on the GPU. The unfortunate part is that the GPU the, well, the whole system on chip with the GPU and so on, with all the firmware that gets loaded onto that is made by Broadcom, and it's closed source. So I have no idea what's going on there. Um, the other nice thing about the Pi is that it makes side channel attacks against the TPM really easy because it, it, it exposes all the bus to you. Uh, side channel attacks aren't that dangerous with TPMs, but they are something you, know, you should worry about. <coughs> okay, so... How does your Raspberry Pi boot up? Well, it's very simple. Uh, there is a piece of code in read-only memory on the system on chip with the GPU. That piece of code's job, at least on the earlier Pis on the, on the Raspberry Pi 4, does a little bit more, uh, is to find an SD card and start searching for a file called bootcode.bin, which contains a whole bunch of interesting stuff uh, that sets up the Pi. Bootcode.bin then goes and searches for a whole bunch of overlays to find out what devices are around and all their properties, um, and runs this on the GPU. One of the overlay files which is supplied uh, with Raspbian is has the wonderful name of tpm-slb9670.dtbo. You might guess that this is the stuff that actually sets up the TPM, or at least allows the Pi to talk to it. That all runs on the GPU, and it's all closed source. So after that piece of closed source runs, then comes start elf, which then sets up the Pi. Uh, the really interesting stuff, such as how much memory do you give to the graphics card, how much memory to the CPU, and a few other features. Uh, this is read from a file called config.txt. The important things here are that you enable the SPI bus, or SPI bus, and you actually enable the overlay. Tell it, you know, you should go and you, you actually use this. Once start has done all that, then it hands control over to the real ARM CPU that does all the hard work and searches for a file called kernel.img, which typically is the Linux kernel that you're running. That's it, that's how a Pi boots up, nothing really special. Kind of different to how x86 works, which we learned in the previous lecture. <coughs> okay, so you wanna do a little bit more than that. Actually, what's going on here is inside the Linux kernel already is the TPM device driver. This is the thing that gives you the actual device that sits in the dev directory, the, and the uh, various major and minor numbers. Uh, it's quite mature. It's actually been around since Linux 2.6.16. So it's there, you know, statically compiled in. I think it's pretty much on every Linux kernel. You can use it right out of the box. Uh, by the way, we're using Raspbian uh, from October 2019 here, but uh, that's only because the later versions make my life easier. Now, there's a whole bunch of interesting tools from Intel. Um, it's not just, in, well, Intel started the project, but Red Hat are involved in a whole bunch of other companies. They're all open source. They're called the TPM2 tools. Uh, they're on GitHub. 
you can go search, you go to Google, you can go search them. Um, there's three main components here. There's a piece of code which is effectively a whole set of libraries that talks the TPM language. Uh, this is called T TSS, and there are a whole bunch of um, libraries inside here. The first one is TCTI, Transmission Control Trusted Something Interface. Uh, this is the thing that knows how to talk to the TPM with the correct protocol over SPI. Then there's SAPI, which is the System Architecture Something Something Interface. Uh, nobody really cares what these mean, and nobody really knows anymore. Um, these are the basic TPM functions. And then because these functions are actually quite low level and so on, there's an extended services API that sits on top of that. So, you know, you have a whole bunch of interfaces that you can write your C or C++ programs to go talk to. And if you're in the lectures yesterday, you know not to use C++. On top of that, there is a daemon called ABRMD, which is a resource manager daemon. Uh, now, if you, as I'll show you on the next slide, there is already a resource manager in the TPM device driver, but nobody uses it. So Intel created their own, which sits out in user land. And what ABRMD can do is because the, the TPM is a very, very memory constrained device, it can actually swap keys in and out dynamically at runtime. And that's a really safe operation to do. Uh, those keys will only be able to be used on that physical TPM. You can't perform a side channel tag, so it's actually quite safe to pull them on and off. That's what ABRMD does. Um, and to be absolutely honest, beyond that, I have no idea what it does. It just sits there, you talk through ABRMD, and it stays out your way. System D starts it, we're fine. Then there's TPM2 tools, which are the a whole set of user land tools, and these are the ones that we're going to see in this presentation. Uh, these have very, very nice command line uh, interfaces for talking to the TPM. So that's what you're going to be using most of the time, unless you want to compile against the libraries and, you know, and so on. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there as well. Um, One-time password generator, there's the TPM2 OpenSSL interface as well. So if you use OpenSSL, uh, but you just want to be really cool about it, then you can use uh, that interface. So OpenSSL will go to the TPM instead of generating its own keys. And there's a whole bunch of other things on top of there. Um, if you want to go and get this, just go download the code. Um, version 4.1, release candidate one is the latest stable of the tools. I like living dangerously, which a certain colleague of mine really hates because she has to keep rewriting her code. Uh, I then go and download the master of the other ones, which breaks all sorts of things. But they're fairly easy to compile. No problem there. Um, maybe on Raspbian, you need to download one or two extra libraries. But it pretty much works outside the box. Standard bootstrap configure, make, make, install. Nothing hard. OK. So you've done all this. You restart your TPM in the, uh, so you restart your Raspberry Pi in the time-honored way of yanking the power cable out and pushing it back in. OK, little caveat. Um, it's a good idea to set up on Raspbian a UDEV rule to change the owner of the TPM devices. Uh, this is because ABRMD, and it should do this in the install script, should not run as root. That would be a very, very dangerous thing to do. So it runs as a, as a user called TSS. Just set that up. It'll make your life much, much easier later on. But if everything has worked, you can go to the dev directory, ls, dev, tpm, and you should see two devices. One is the tpm, and the other one is the resource manager in the kernel, which nobody uses. Anyway, if you see dev tpm 0, it's working. Um, if you want to test it, pull the TPM off, reboot the thing, and it'll disappear. So, hey, that's, that's success. If you get that far, that's good. Real success, however, is doing this. Um, if, you, if you've compiled all the tools and you see the devices and ABRMD is running and systemd hasn't complained, etc., go to the command line and just type tpm2 get random 16, because I want 16 random digits, dash dash hex, because I want to be able to read them, and you'll get something like this. If you get the same answer as me, A, you're very lucky or everything is broken. OK? Uh, but on the other hand, you know, it, you know, if I get the same random number every time, it's still random. That's the definition. So um, you know, if this works, yay. Everything is great. In fact, it's remarkably easy to get to here. It would take maybe uh, an hour of compilation time. You know, the Raspberry Pis aren't that fast. You can do cross-compilation if you really want to. 
Um, or if you're like me, um, I do it in a Raspberry Pi 1 and wait about a week. Um, okay. So you get this far. Your TPM is working. There you are. That's a real hardware random number generator. Isn't that cool? Enthusiastic. Okay. So what's inside this thing? Well, first of all, um, you know, it has memory. It has a little bit of processing capability. Um, but the way it works is to be a real secure device, even if you strip all the plastic off, which somebody did with a TPM 1.2 about 12 years ago. It took them six months, but there you are. And an electron microscope. I mean, these things aren't hard to go and hack if you have you know, a lab full of equipment and a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, everything inside is accessed through handles, and handles point to objects. Um, for those who get really excited about object orientation, hey, you'll love, the TP you'll love the TPM. So inside, everything is accessed through handles. There are some predefined handles which point to predefined objects. Other things come and go, or they, you can make them persistent so they survive uh, power cycles, and some are just transient. Uh, pull the power, gone forever. Uh, inside there, uh, you have a number of hierarchies. You have persistent objects and permanent objects. And there are various kinds of these. And I have to look at the screen over here. So there are uh, banks of PCR registers, keys, NVRAM areas, a whole bunch of things. And you can actually find out what you've got on board your Pi. Uh, there's a command called TPM2 getcap. Getcap tells you the capabilities of your device, because TPMs actually have different capabilities. There's a, there's a minimal set and a maximal set. And you can guess what gets implemented at the end of the day. So, really exciting things. Uh, the thing at handle 0x40001 is actually an object that defines what's known as a hierarchy. And I'll talk about that in the next stage. Um, below down there, you'll also see that I have a persistent object, um, which I think is an RSA key that I've loaded, I've generated on the TPM. I've loaded in, I've made it uh, persistent. So I've put an RSA key on the TPM, and it quite happily sits there. I can pull the public key out. I can't pull the private key out. I have to do any encryption, decryption action on the TPM in a secure manner. OK, these hierarchies. On board the TPM are a set of fuses. Um, these fuses are blown at manufacturing time. Some TPMs actually have a register which you can reset, so you can change its identity in a random manner. These fuses define seeds, and those seeds are then used as the basis of the key generation functions for four hierarchies, platform, owner, endorsement, and null. Uh, the names don't really mean that much, um, but basically, you have four authorization hierarchies. Think of it as being four user, user accounts. And each one of these then can be associated with a, pa with a password. And it's, it's very, very easy to work with these. There's a command called change auth, which will allow you to change the passwords on each one of these hierarchies. And every time you interact with an object under one of those hierarchies, you have to supply the password. Um, some TPMs, you are actually able to regenerate those seeds. If you do that, any keys underneath that are now broken forever. The password's broken forever. Uh, you've changed the device identity. You can't go back. Uh, the TPMs that we have on the Raspberry Pis, you can see with the command, TPM2 get commands, grep change, produces nothing. These are fixed. This is a fused device. OK. There is a process called taking ownership of the TPM, which basically means setting passwords on things. So this is a little word of caution. Uh, on the left-hand side, is about a million euros worth of Nokia airframe OC18 servers. OC18 servers are massive telco optimized, dual Xeon everything, fantastic amounts of memory, really, really damned expensive. Okay, they are so optimized, they do not even have keyboard sockets. Okay, nice machines. They have a TPM soldered onto the motherboard. I have a colleague who, well, we were at a conference in Nice, and he calls up and says, um, I can't get into the TPM, can't issue it. It says wrong password. OK, um, what do I do? Well, it, it's easy. You wait 24 hours. There's a lockout process. Three wrong passwords locks the TPM for 24 hours. Wait 24 hours. Next day, calls me. Uh, doesn't work. Well, how long did you wait? Uh, 23 hours, 50 minutes. Okay. Call me tomorrow at this time. Next day, calls me. 
Still doesn't work. Incorrect password. This goes on for three days before he calls, I wrote the password down wrongly. Okay, so now you've locked the TPM forever on a 15,000 euro machine. Um, I said, did you follow the instructions we give? Yes. Did you follow the big red letters that said, do not run take ownership command because you will lose access to your machine if you screw it up? Yes. What did you do? I ran take ownership and wrote the password down wrongly. Great. Um, he did this three times. Yep, 45,000 euros worth of machines no longer can be trusted because somebody did not read the instructions. Warning, do not forget things. If you change, if, if you change passwords, set passwords, whatever, if you forget that password, type it wrongly, you will lose access to that TPM forever. Okay, don't do it. You will cry. Uh, you will cry and even a lot more when you've done it with three very, very expensive servers. So, okay. The really nice feature about TPM is that you can store keys. You can generate keys. And the way it works is you have these three hierarchies. We don't worry about null because that's a bit weird. Um, you have these three hierarchies. Typically, you work under the owner hierarchy because maybe, um, you know, the OEM or so on might have provisioned things under platform. The first thing you need to do is generate a primary key under that. So that's the key that's generated from the seed. If I think of it as the root key in a CA. And then under that, then you can generate all sorts of other keys that are actually linked to that. So you've, you, you know, if you understand how certificate chains work and so on, yep, that's exactly how the TPM works. You build up hierarchies of keys. When you generate a key on a TPM, the private key is locked inside. If you're using public private keys, uh, you can always extract the public key or the certificate. Uh, you also have this thing called a context object, which effectively is the private key and the public key wrapped up together, but in a form that can only be decrypted on that particular TPM. So you can actually pull these things off. Um, you can even set the keys so you can actually move them between TPMs, but that's, that's an operation that's rarely done. I don't know anybody who does that, but typically when you generate the keys, they're locked to that TPM forever but you can create these hierarchies. And, and this is what the process looks like. So you just run the command tpm2 create primary. Um, I'm generating an RSA key using SHA-256 under the endorsement hierarchy. Um, and then I dump out onto disk uh, an object which contains the public and private key, the name, and a few other things locked for that tpm. I can't do anything with this context. Only the tpm can work with that context object. And, and it dumps all this stuff back to me. There you are, I've generated an RSA key and now I can go decrypt, encrypt, sign, verify, and so on. <coughs> you notice it has some attributes. Uh, fixed TPM means that this context object is only usable on that TPM. If somebody steals that context object and loads it onto another TPM, it will not work. It's secure. Um, you can also see that it's, I can also perform decryption and encryption operations and so on. Um, use with auth, if I want to use this key, then the TPM will force me to enter the password of the endorsement hierarchy. So it's even password protected. You have a whole bunch of other interesting options in there for key generation. Once you've done that, once you've got your primary key, you wouldn't normally work with these. What you might like to do is generate your own keys, build up your own hierarchy, intermediate keys, and so on. Uh, here's uh, the creation of an AAS key. Um, you notice the thing at the end basically says, I'm now referring to the endorsement key that I generated earlier. This is to say that I now want to build it under that hierarchy. Very, very simple. Once I've generated that, I will then go and load that key onto the TPM. If you load something onto the TPM, it goes into it into the transient uh, memory. Uh, then I will issue a command called evict control, great, fantastic name, which basically says, okay, take that temporary uh, piece of data and load it permanently onto the TPM. And it's now there persistently until I decide to kick it off. And then I can run a command tpm to get cap handles persistent. And now you can see that um, I've loaded this key into 0x8101003. And now I can use that for all sorts of interesting operations later on. Um, exercises for reader, um, because this takes time to do. One, you can load keys from external sources. You can generate keys with open SSL and load those onto the TPM under these hierarchies. Uh, you can use different algorithms. 
uh, AES, DES, RSA, whatever you want. There's a whole bunch of um, interesting algorithms. There's a command to go and find all these, and it generates a huge bunch of data for you. Which, so if you want some exotic uh, ecliptic, ecliptic curve function or whatever, it's probably there on the TPM and so on. So exercise for Redux, I'm not going to do it now. Uh, you're on your own. Now, there are two really interesting keys on the TPM called the endorsement key and the attestation key, and these were talked about earlier. From the seeds in the platform hierarchy, you can generate a key called the endorsement key. This is a general purpose key. Typically, uh, you generate it as an RSA 2048-bit key. This is locked in the TPM, and the nice thing about this key is every time you generate it, it will be the same unless you manage to change the seeds. It's one of the very few keys that are unique to the device. From the EK, you can then generate an attestation key, which is a signing-only key, which is used in quoting operations, which were mentioned earlier. You can extract the public certificates from these. You can use these keys to lock pieces of MVRAM and so on. And they would form the basis of the device identifier composition engine architecture, with, which is this cool specification from TCG that tells you how to build unique permanent identities for devices. You can use these keys as your TPM's permanent identity, unless you have a TPM where you can change the Cs, in which case, good luck. Really, really simple operation. Uh, create eek dump it into a handle, there you are, done. You can use that for signing whatever. Uh, the AK, similarly, I just say, I want to go and generate from the EK, the attestation key, there's a specific operation to do that because these things are special. Um, due to a slight change in the tools, they now dump the AK out to disk first as a context object, which you must then go and load in later. But you see at the bottom here, I've now loaded both the AK and the EK into the TPM. Remember this 0x8101006, it'll come in important later on. Um, I actually ran this as a script last night on a Raspberry Pi at Nokia. If anybody wants to see this run, see me afterwards and I'll actually log into this. I'll give you the IP address, Nokia VPN, um, it's Pi Raspberry, okay? I'm really big on security. Okay, um, here's a nice thing. This is how you encrypt things uh, on the TPM. You, there's a command, in this case, RSA encrypt. You give it uh, the handle of a suitable key. Uh, you pass in a file called, and in this case, secret stuff. Um, and then you dump out at secretstuff.enc because that's done. And you can see with the two cat commands, you know, it's the secret file says it contains secret information. And all of you can do decryption in your heads. And you should be able to verify that that piece of binary there, which is incorrectly printed on this terminal, is actually the encrypted form of this is secret stuff. If you can't do this in your heads, uh, well, I can give you some time to do it. It's, it's fine. We'll get you the binary later. OK, that's how you do encryption. But it's not a fast process. If you do any more than about 256 bytes, forget it. And actually, some TPMs will not accept more than about 256 bytes anyway. Um, if you want to do decryption, signing and verification, Go learn to do it yourself. I, you know, I'm not going to give you everything. You're supposed to go play with this stuff. So that's as, as an exercise to the reader because I'm an academic at heart. Another cool feature, non-volatile memory. These things have memory and it's persistent. Again, access through handles. So you have an NVRAM area and inside that NVRAM area you have a set of properties. The size of the area, the actual data stored inside that. There can be a password associated with that area. There are policies and then access control. And I'll come to those later on because that's a really cool operation called sealing. And that's the one that will really make you cry. OK, here's an example. If you want to store some data, whatever data you want on that TPM, you can define some area. And what I've done here is I've, I've said <coughs> define an, an NVRAM area. I think it's 32, but yeah, 32 bytes. Um, I'll, I'll give it a handle. Then I'll say, I'll actually create it in this case under the platform hierarchy. So what this C0x46001, that's actually the handle of the platform hierarchy and that tells the TPM that I need to provide any authorization that the platform hierarchy requires. Remember, taking ownership. Uh, I'll need to provide that in order to create this NVRAM area under that. And also if I want to go and access that NVRAM area, I'll need to provide that information. And you can see now, 
Um, you know, even though this is a permanent, this is a persistent handle, it doesn't appear in the list of persistent handles. So you just don't know what NVRAM you have on board sometimes and what's there. But anyway, very simple. I can then go right to that area. Uh, in this case, I'm writing to the area and I'm saying use the ownership um, hierarchy as the authorization. Uh, I'm writing in the file secret stuff and then I'm reading it out. Very, very simple. I've set no passwords on there and no other authorization, which is why this is really nice and easy. But you can just pull data on and off. And we actually use that for some software that we have. We write into the TPM um, all our configuration data for a certain piece of software. Uh, then we seal that area against the software hashes and so on. Uh, so if somebody goes and modifies the software, they can't pull that data. And I'll explain that operation a little bit later on. OK. So keys, pretty cool, NVRAM. The really cool feature, and this is measured boot, uh, it all now depends on the platform configuration registers. And, this, and the TPM2 standard says, I have at least two banks of 24 registers that store either SHA-1 hashes or SHA-256. There can be others, but they're not defined as standard. Uh, no, that's manufacturer specific. Each platform configuration register has two properties, the value which it stores, and then the locality. And the locality is an additional access control function. So when your PC boots up, uh, the TPM is in locality zero. And you can write to any PCR register. As soon as you write to the C CRTM, uh, to PCR zero on an x86 machine, you change the locality to one. You can no longer write back to PCR zero, only all the other registers. And you can set this locality value for the, for the registers. Typically what happens is once you get up to user land, locality four is available and locality four then says you can only write to PCRs 23 and 16. So it's another additional access control mechanism. Um, you, as was explained in the previous lecture, you do not write to these, you extend them. So in this example, I just generated two SHA-1 sums of the command line and the kernel. Uh, TPM2 PCR read SHA-1 23, 23, that's giving me the current value of PCR 23 from the SHA-1 bank. Uh, I can confirm that is a valid SHA-1 hash. I will then issue commands PCR extend, extend 23 and write in the SHA-1 of, say, the kernel. And if I go and read that out, uh, again, you can do this in your head. If you take 0x, lots of zeros, SHA-1, concatenate it with the hash E065 and so on, and take the SHA-1 of that, then you will get 0x E3417. Yes, somebody confirm? Good. Um, and you can see I'll just then perform the operation again. Effectively, what you have is a Merkle tree of hashes. So if somebody goes and uh, changes my kernel, I'll get a different, you know, as Merkle trees work, I'll get this rippling up against all the ne next extends. So you can't write to these, you always extend them. On x86 machines, as my colleague explained earlier, uh, some of these have default values or default usages. PCR0 is for the core root trust measurement. PCRs 1, 2, and 3 are measurements of the BIOS or UEFI or whatever firmware you have. 4 and 5 of the bootloader. 6 and 7 from the OEM and the launch control policies. 8 and 9 are used by some UEFI implementations. 10 and 14 are de facto used by Linux IMA, the integrity measurement architecture, uh, which will go and measure your file system at runtime. 16 is user defined. 17 and 18 are used by T-Boot and Intel TXT. Uh, if you have an Intel uh, x86 processor, an i5, i7, or Xeon, uh, then during the boot processes, these processors can sandbox themselves, uh, measure whatever is in memory, which is typically the Linux kernel and all its modules, write values and a log into the TPM and various other places in the ACPI tables and UEFI, release the processor and boot. So you, you get a measurement of the kernel before the kernel loads, but after it's been loaded into memory. 23, user defined. Um, the other PCRs, yeah, use as you wish. There's no definition for those. On ARM, however, we have a different situation. It's much easier. There's no definition. The reason there's no definition is because there was an enormous argument about this at the TCG, with every ARM manufacturer saying, we want to do it our way, which is why they settled on device identity instead. 
Okay, so how do I make this thing trusted when I boot up? Um, well, I did tell you um, there's a little issue with the Broadcom stuff. So I've got two choices. I can either go and hack the system and chip on the Broadcom software, or I can fake it. Guess what I did? That's right, I got out the soldering iron. Uh, yeah, it was just too much. I, uh, we, we hit a few very, yeah, we, we faked it, okay? Yeah, yeah, beat me up for it, I don't care. Uh, if you want to go hack the Broadcom stuff, do it yourself. Um, you know, soldering iron, silicon, solder fumes, and I'm sure Broadcom lawyers will have a field day with you. Um, but really, it would be very, very nice if they opened this up. What we did was create a whole bunch of little scripts that went and faked the boot sequence, as was described earlier. Uh, Measure.start is the important one here, and then we created a uh, systemd service um, that's called this script. We had um, some fun with this, actually. We actually realized uh, that on the Pi zeros, the really little ones with a single core, there was a race condition in the Linux kernel which allowed um, systemd to start before Linux had finished loading in all the device drivers and all the modules, which is a bit of a problem because the TPM module was loaded after systemd had tried to access the TPM. It took us ages to figure that one out. It's now fixed. Anyway, we faked it. How did we fake it? Well, we went through all the important files doing boot up. Uh, actual, we made the CRTM out of the actual measurement script. So if you change the measurement scripts, you'll break the CRTM. Um, PCR1, first stage of, boot of bootloader, plus the overlays, plus some other special files. Uh, PCR2 was the issue, so we knew which part we were working with. PCR3 for start elf and config text. PCR4 was the kernel and command line. PCR5 message of the day. And we generated a log file with all these hashes in, so you could actually see what was going on, actually reconstruct this stuff. So we basically uh, faked or copied and did it in a very ARM-like way with ARM stuff, uh, the UEFI boot process. But this is how it works. And the nice thing about doing this is that actually you can now go and experiment without really screwing things up. Because going into the BIOS on your laptop on some, you know, and messing with the uh, settings there, that's really not a clever thing to do. Okay, hands up who's actually bricked their PC due to playing with the BIOS. Yeah, yeah. tears. <laughs> um, you can do some more things with this. Um, I noticed <coughs> it's now possible to compile SE Linux into Raspbian. So you can do the runtime measurements. Uh, but you do not get Intel TXT, DRTM. It's not available on ARM, obviously. OK, so don't try to do that. It's not going to work. Um, anyway, this is what my Raspberry Pi, as of this morning, looked like. And as you can tell, this is a well-trusted Raspberry Pi. Um, you know, I think these measurements are good. At least, I, well, they're the ones I got, so that's, that's good enough for me. So this is what it looks like. There was a process talked about earlier called quoting. And this is where the TPM gets really interesting. Because if I want to go and test this, I can either go read off these values, which are just text, or I can go to the TPM and say, go generate a hash value using this nonce for these values, and then go sign it with the attestation key. You remember that from earlier? and then give me the quote back. And what I actually get back at the end of the day is a big structure here called quoted. It's in, it dumps it out in YAML. Uh, FF54 tells me immediately it's a TPM test structure. Yes, it, our lives are that sad that we know we can read these in binary. Um, that's the test structure. That's the quote that you get back. Um, I know it's been signed by an RSA key, which is probably the AK. Uh, and then we also get the signature of that structure as well. So what I can do is use TPM Verify or OpenSSL to go and verify that that quote actually came from that TPM because I was clever and extracted out the public keys from earlier. Um, actually, actually, what really does come back is a whole bunch of binary, which you see at the bottom there. What's inside this structure, TPM test. It's the most important structure on the TPM. There's a magic number, FF544347. You'll actually realize that the three Hex digits then spell TCG. Um, 8101 is a type code for the TPMS structure. Qualified signer is, a, is the hash of the key that generated this. So not only can we verify it 
uh, using cryptographic means, we, we can also go into the key and actually see which, who actually signed it. The extra data is the nonce. Then we get the clock info. Um, we can see that this TPM has been reset 28 times. Um, it's never been suspended, and it's in a safe mode because it's been shut down. I know the firmware version of this, 0007 and so on. And then the structure below, which says attested. The interesting one here is the line that says PCR digest, which is a concatenation of all the hashes I just asked for. Um, and I actually asked them for as a SHA-256. So that's a SHA-256 hash of all the PCR registers uh, that made up the quote. That, that's the number that's really important. If that number changes, then things are broken. So how do I use this? Well, you have something called remote attestation. Um, this is the usual state of my desk. Um, here we have cyber Ebola, cyber Zika, cyber, oh, some other diseases and so on. Um, these are the friends of the pie you saw earlier. What you would typically do is you take the AK public from each one of these, you take quotes off them, and then use an attestation server to check that that quote is valid and it has the correct PCR digest for those machines. So if you go to that box, change something, requote, then you'll get different values and the attestation server will say, well, I won't allow you to join this system or whatever you want. Where do the known good values come from? Well, either they come out of your own head or they come from knowing how your supply chain process works. Uh, typically in the provisioning process, we kind of, because it's really hard to go back to the supply chain process, um, typically we get the device, we take a quote of it straight away and say, okay, that's our starting point. Um, you know, if it changes from that, then something bad has happened. Or if we put a new kernel on, then we'll reprovision it and load those new values up back up into the attestation server. If you reboot with a Raspberry Pi, and this will come back and haunt you many times, as it is to us, every time we rebooted the damn thing, the PCRs would be wrong. Until we realized that on x86 machines, when you reboot, the TPM and the CPU are actually powered off. On the Raspberry Pi, the GPIO pins, so the power lines to the GPIO pins, are permanently on, they are connected to the power supply. So when you reboot your Pi, the TPM actually isn't restarted at all. It never powers off. Hence, there is a nice process where if we need to reboot the Pi, uh, we press the reset button, um, pull the power cable out, push it back in, and it comes up like a new fresh device. Um, we had great fun of this. We were presenting in Nice, in France, uh, with, you know, we had a nice demo around this attestation server. Uh, in order to demonstrate rebooting, we would call up our student in Helsinki, who would then go into the office at 3 o'clock in the morning, reset all the pies, and he would sit around all day waiting for the order for us to reboot. Good students. Okay, uh, we, we, we gave him some biscuits and food and water. It's fine, don't worry. Okay, so now we've got these PCR registers. What can we do with these? Well, the really neat feature of TPM is that you can start sealing things. Because all these objects have relationships, uh, we can also assign policies and access control rights uh, to the NVRAM area. Here's how the process works. You collect the PCRs that you need. And in this example, I wrote some PCRs. I wrote some values into PCRs 10 and 11. Don't worry what they are, it doesn't matter. Then I create a policy out of those. And what this policy does, it takes those values, wraps it up into a TPM policy structure, which does some other clever things, uh, and then generates me a file called PCR policy. Uh, and that's actually the, uh, the output of that. What I then do is define an NVRAM area. I define a new, <coughs> new NVRAM area under, I th think it's either the platform or the ownership, I can't remember what that handle is. Uh, and I associate a policy with it, and then I associate access control. And I, s I say here that you can only access this NVRAM area um, if the policy is correct. I can only read if the policy is correct. I can only read if the I can only write if the policy is correct. And the policy means here that I need to supply the correct PCR values in order to read and write from that NVRAM area. I can add other things, passwords. I can assign it with all sorts of interesting features. Um, you can even do things such as uh, as soon as you read from it, you go trash that NVRAM area. That's a nice feature. So. Anyway, now I've got an NVRAM index. I write my secrets in, so this file is secret stuff, and then I can read out. Note that no longer 
I am no longer asking the platform or the ownership or the endorsement hierarchies for the authorization control. I'm actually asking the NVRAM area itself because the NVRAM area is now actually behaving as if it was a hierarchy of its own. So it has all the information about how it should be accessed under what conditions. And you can see with this NVWrite instruction, I'm saying, go read from the NVRAM area, use the policy and access rights defined on that NVRAM area, and pass in the current values of PCRs in the SHA-1, 10, and 11 registers. And if all this works out, I get the text back saying, this is secret information. This is a really good thing to do with your disk encryption keys. Load them into the TPM and seal that NVRAM area against the configuration of your PC. That way you know that if somebody then attacks the firmware of your PC or you get an unauthorized update or some other interesting tag, which I'll talk about now, um, you, you will not be able to get access to that disk encryption key again ever unless you can return to the state that you were in previously. There's a slight warning in there you might, you know, this is a really good way to lose access to things. Um, why would you don't do this? Uh, there's a very nice attack called the Evil Maid attack. Uh, Johanna Ruskova, a very nice Polish lady who developed Cubes OS, uh, coined the term. Um, hands up who's ever left their laptop unattended in a hotel room, train, plane. Yeah. Uh, and what happens if you plug a USB stick into that and reboot it? Mm, yeah, you can do some really bad things, okay? That's the evil maid attack. The name comes from the fact that you leave your laptop in a hotel room, the maid comes in, plugs a USB stick. She doesn't have to know what she's doing. She just plugs it in and follows some instructions given to her by a three-letter agency. This does not happen, has never happened. Honestly, I can tell you some stories from a certain Far Eastern country where this may or may not have happened. Uh, I also know a company based in Germany who will actually produce you the USB sticks to go and do this. They won't sell to normal people. They only sell to gov trustworthy governments was their marketing slogan. But um, yeah, so this is a very, very real attack. If you ever come back to your hotel room and your laptop is warm, somebody has tried to tamper with it. So this is the defense against that. Um, public service announcement, um, if you go search for Evil Maid, make sure say search is on in your browser. I spent hours last night, literally hours, looking for a sensible picture. And then I realized safe search was off. Anyway. Um, OK, so what happens if you attempt to read from the NVRAM area? Um, in this example, I've tampered with the machine. I changed one of the PCRs. If I go and try to read that area, hey, it doesn't work anymore. And that's, you know, if you stick your disk encryption key in there or your Bitcoin password, uh, yeah, keep it backed up somewhere else, otherwise there will be tears. Uh, there's a very nice story from Britain about the guy who had a Bitcoin password, um, threw the PC away, and then realized that he, you know, the key was on the disk, and then had to go digging through a rubbish dump, eventually found it, realized he'd actually also thrown away the, the note with the password on. So apparently there's a lot of Bitcoins. You have been warned. This is a great way to lose data. Um, what next? Well, for those of you who are now really excited by TPM and you know hardware stuff, uh, there are possibilities for um, using OpenSSL with the TPM. So there's a module that's supplied with the TPM2 tools that will go talk to uh, OpenSSL. Um, so there's a TPM2 TSS engine. And here's a really exciting example. Um, similar to get random earlier, this is now doing get random through OpenSSL. I mean, this is exciting stuff, guys. Come on. OK. Other things you could do, PKCS stores. Um, so if you have a whole set of keys that you want to protect, you can use the TPM to protect those keys while they're on disk and so on. And then they, they can get used by SSH and what other, other things. Uh, there's a nice one-time password system that's in there that generates a QR code at boot time, which you can take a picture of. And then you can verify whether anything has happened after that. Trusted timestamping, um, you can you know, generate from NTP a time. You can then sign out with the TPM and so on. And lots of other stuff. So that's all the low level stuff. Where we're working at the moment is we, you know, we want to get into the verticals. It's all very nice having trusted hardware, but the question we want to ask at this moment is, what, once you have all this trusted hardware, how can we use it in safety critical systems? 
Why safety critical systems? Because IoT light bulbs are not really interesting, but a 200 kilometer an hour locomotive really is. Uh, you can also see why priorities lie with trying to get things through our purchasing system. Um, trust me, it's really hard to buy light bulbs in our purchasing system. But I did find out we have Siemens as a accredited supplier, so I can buy a two and a half million euro locomotive. There you are, a uh, big company is purchasing. So, um, what do you see on this diagram up here? All the things we know how to do already. Sign software, hardware, OS, static file system integrity, core and remote attestation, all easy stuff. Uh, we got into workload pl placement, so if you're working in cloud environments, then maybe you want your virtual machines only running on certain hardware in certain configurations. So you can drive workload placement with that. Um, edge integrity, so going from the core server stuff, you know, we're now putting very, very powerful computers right out on the edge of the network. And then we have the IoT devices, which, you know, does anybody have a secure IT, IoT device or know of one? I mean, who's, who actually has a home automation system? Okay, is it secure? Trusted? Signed? Uh, yeah, okay. Can you give me your address later? I'll come around, I'll show you some tricks with it. Um, okay, so what have we been doing with this? Our current project at the moment, um, we're actually building a virtual railway signaling center, and then which will actually allow us to go and explore what happens when you perform firmware attacks against railway signaling systems. Um, if you think this is not a problem, um, you know, if you want to hack a train, um, most trains you get on board, there will be a cupboard somewhere with some screws you can undo, maybe it's a triangular key, and you'll find a rack of servers in there with exposed USB ports and networking cables. Um, as security people, or, you, know, you should have a pretty good idea what you can do with exposed USB ports, network cables, reset buttons, and so on. So, you know, you know, we have critical infrastructure, uh, critical things like trains and aircraft and so on that are not protected. You could write whatever software on and you would never notice. Um, quick story, uh, how the world will end. Um, so a few years ago, I was at a university in Scandinavia. I was on the seventh floor of the building. I went to the bathroom. And um, being a security guy, I looked around and on the floor, there is a small box with a cable coming out of it. So I ripped it off the wall, um, opened it up, and found inside, oh, it's, it's a water detector. OK? Um, you notice six little silver contacts. Uh, that's the reflashing pins. I also discovered that underneath is an 80 mega 32 uh, microcontroller. So effectively, it's an Arduino with the reflashing pins exposed. So what I could do is I could fire up my you know, Arduino toolkit, I could re-go and reflash the water detection or the flood detection sensor in a toilet. If you do not think that is exciting, how about if I told you that uh, a few years back, somebody managed to update the firmware on similar kinds of sensors that reported back that these uranium centrifuges are working perfectly while instructing the motors to start adding in vibrations, increase the temperatures, and so on. It's Stuxnet. So any IoT device where you can upload the firmware without verification of actually what's loaded onto that and without the device being in a position where it can be either locally or remotely attested can do damage. Um, uh, I guess most of you drive cars, braking systems on cars, little microcontroller on the brake discs tells you whether the brakes are wearing out. There are microcontrollers actually on the brake calipers that uh, tell the car how to brake, ABS and so on. Now what happens if you start altering the firmware on those? And the second question is, how would you even detect it? Do you trust your car? Do you trust your home automation system? Do you trust the water sensor in your bathroom? Okay, that's how the world is going to end. Okay, so you've been warned. So I'll stop there with a real trusted pie. Any questions?